So, hello, uh, I'm Daniel, this is Gregor. Uh, we are going to present this brief talk uh, on HPC Unikernels and OpenStack. So, let's see how this works. Oh, yeah. So, now we have, um, here we have the talk structure. Uh, we're going to have it in two uh, parts. First part is about our project Michelangelo. This is necessary because we are promoting the work from there. Um, and then we're going to go dive in into unicorns. This is going to be done by Gregor. I'm going to be sitting somewhere here. Uh, later on in Q&A section, of course, or if you need to ask any questions, just find us out, hunt us down, no problem. Okay, let's start. Okay, so this is good motivation. This gets you uh, out of the bed uh, each morning. And basically, good old Chuck Norris always says something, and this time it says that we, as a project, want to make your computing more efficient. Let's go into details. So, what, are the, what is the problem we are trying to solve? Uh, namely, we have HPC centers, right? These are big things, usually a lot of cores, a lot of um, big clients, a lot of big fat simulations, uh, like, like this one here, oh, maybe not, like this one here. Um, for that, of course, you need this kind of machinery, right? But on the other hand, you have a lot of small companies who do a lot of, a lot of simulation on, on their own. So basically, small simulations, small things, uh, which actually build up to these bigger things. Think Boeing and subcontractors, so this kind of stuff. Um, these guys, of course, are here. Now, HPC centers want to cater for these guys, right? They, they see a huge market. Uh, there are companies addressing this market, like the Uber Cloud, or even European projects like Fortissimo, Fortissimo 2, and so on. Uh, also, uh, big software packages will provide you with uh, the capacity to run your workload in the cloud or in HPC cluster, something like that. Uh, and these big guys have a problem. They're not flexible enough. They have an issue with changing uh, their uh, nodes, uh, with, uh, I don't know, being able to, to get the load from some workstation and just run it without a queue or something like that. So they know they have a problem. They know they have a market. And uh, they're trying to address that. On the other side of the coin, we have these small companies, uh, small to medium enterprises. Uh, of course, what do they want to do? They want to have maximum performance on their already bought infrastructure. They, they don't care, basically. They, they, they have the machines. Uh, they just want to use it completely to the last uh, cycle. Of course, if it's OK, if it makes sense for them, like total cost of ownership and so on and so forth, they would like to avoid vendor lock-in, obviously. So they would like to go for something that's open. What's our offer? So this is what we are offering to these guys. This is improved virtual infrastructure. So for HPC guys, we want to give them in virtualized infrastructure, so software, uh, in a way that sysadmin in, I don't know, HLRS, uh, HP Center in Europe, won't just start jumping around about the last cycles. Uh, for SMEs, of course, we want to give them really fast virtual infrastructure um, just uh, by offering something that's already standardized and so on. OK, so now you know what we are trying to solve, what's the problem we are solving. Now, let's go a bit deeper into overall approach than, of course, unikernels. So when we start a project, we set out a lot of big, lofty goals like improved responsiveness, agility, security of virtual infrastructure, so like big things. When we looked into this matter, we saw that phew, a lot of stuff has already been solved. Okay? Uh, then we said, OK, let's try and see what's not been solved. And I.O., virtual I.O., hasn't been solved, really. Um, and when I say virtual I.O., I mean in guest in host, in between. Also, when you, when you look at the things like just general efficiency, like size of images and so on. Of course, the second thing we wanted, we said, OK, when we are building this, we don't want just to go for clouds uh, or HPC cloud, whatever that is, or just HPCs. We want to build something 
that's like okay that you can deploy it everywhere, just take some components out of it and so on. Of course, with these two goals, we then had, we then had additional issues like we want to have stuff upstream so it doesn't just die after two years of the, after the project is finished. Uh, we want to have it standardized, I don't know, like using standard cloud management software like, I don't know, OpenStack, for example. Uh, and of course, the packaging of applications, streamlining of this, uh, adding some monitoring, security, which is really important, of course, and so on. Just to remember everybody, uh, this idea is not really new. This is the first part uh, with unicorns and so on. We had lightweight kernels back in the day. You have the timeline here. Uh, it's been taken from um, some of the kitten presentations, so you can see it's already quite old. Now if we look, the overall approach, I said, okay, uh, we have lofty goals. Uh, now let's try and, and see what the layers actually are. So on the lowest layer, we have guest. We chose OSV as our unikernel. Uh, we have here IO, IO optimization, of course, application deployment, because the original one was so-so. Then we have KVM, everybody knows it. Uh, we added components like IOCM, Z-Corks, coming from IBM. Uh, that just improve the I.O. Of course, between these two, uh, virtual RDMA uh, and so on. Uh, if we go to OpenStack, what we are doing actually, we are trying to, uh, we are supporting, of course, all the uh, image work, so Glance is uh, just working with OSV. Uh, we have hit templates, cloud init support and so on. And of course, then we have some nice demonstrators like on the right, uh, typical HPC applications talking about Fortran, uh, open foam, of course, then you have cloud bursting examples, uh, also some stuff, big, big, big data, and so on. Uh, we beefed up the security a bit on the host side. Uh, it's funnily called SCAM. Uh, and of course, we added monitoring from Intel uh, called SNAP. What do we want out of this? Well, XLAP as a company, uh, and all the other partners have this kind of stuff in mind when they say exploitation, right? So like adding or getting some metrics and analytics, inclusion of I in IoT products or data centers, uh, and of course HPC Cloud for, for the biggest HPC uh, providers. Consortium is here. Uh, I, I'm, I think you know most of the names. For the smaller ones, which you don't know, get back to us. We don't want to lose any time with that. Um, and okay, we are done with this introduction. Take it away, Gregor. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Let's see. Is it working? Hopefully it will. So um, the, ma major the majority of this talk uh, will deal with the unikernels. Um, so basically, we'll start with the introduction so that everybody knows what we mean when we, de when we say it, a unikernel. Then we will discuss how these are actually used in a real wor world, so basically tr real, real applications that are um, foundations of the Michelangelo project. Um, and then we will we'll show the case studies how this was, was done uh, for this application and also try to discuss briefly what the plans for the project um, are in the future. So basically, this is, this is the, 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 the diagram that shows what, what the purpose of the, of the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes will be. Um, at the bottom layer, we, we are going to discuss about the unikernel, the application <coughs> packaging, the application management, and of course also the integration and the use of OpenStack resources to launch unikernel applications there um, with ease. So to get started, um, contrary to, to ordinary operating systems that we are accustomed um, right now, uh, so Linux, mostly Linux, um, the Unicode is comprised of just those three main components. So we have a bootloader that will ensure that the kernel, which is rather small, including just the major components, major drivers that are needed to run in, in the target environment. And then we have the application libraries and the data. So there are no redundant tools, no redundant drivers that are not needed in the target architectures um, or deployment scenarios um, for, for the applications. Um, so the kernel will, will only contain the following few components, basi basically the drivers for, for, the, uh, for the block devices, for the network devices, um, will, will contain some standard libraries, some standard tools. 
and of course the file system so that things can be read from the disk and the application itself it will just contain what it needs to run on this container image uh, on this image and all this is wrapped into a bootable machine image we are not explicitly mentioning that it's a virtual machine although at least in the, in the scope of the project we are mostly interested in virtual environments but in the end it's not necessary that these bootable machine images are virtual so they can be deployed in bare metal as well um, we have decided to split the unikernels into three main uh, types the first one um, it's, it's basically the, the, the new the new era of unikernels they are language specific meaning that they require specific language to be used and they require specific tool chains to be used um, in um, in this context so for example the Mirage OS will, will require OCaml um, then there is Haskell, Clive is for Go and Include OS is for C++ applications um, in order to use this unicorn, th these four unicorns for example you have to rewrite at least parts of your applications um, so that the, the unikernel will actually launch the, the source code of your application. We've added uh, one specific purpose unikernel, which is Hermitcore. Um, as the authors say, say um, on their website, it's not yet production ready, but its mission is to support HPC in particular, so HPC applications in particular. And then there is the last, the last type, which we call the general purpose um, and then uh, so the two the two representatives here are rump run and OSV they are completely different in their um, architecture and concepts but the main the main idea that they share is that uh, most applications that are available on current systems should be executed on these two types of unikernels and as Daniel said before um, our unikernel of choice is OSV. Um, as the creators say, it's a new operating system designed for the cloud. And here are some reasons why we decided to use the OSV. First, our goal is to support as much as many applications as possible out of the box. Um, it's unique because it really provides some gener general purpose um, baseline that is solid and it works and it's mature and it can also run different types of applications written in various languages um, running on various types of runtime engines next um, it's I, I won't say it's fully standards compliant but it's probably the most of those that I've mentioned before so um, in, 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 in a sense if you have a, a, an application that runs on Linux on POSIX systems it will most probably run on OSV as well. It has KVM support as, w uh, as well as some, some other hypervisors, of course, and KVM was our choice in the project. Um, it has demonstrated superior net sorry, network per performance in the past, um, and one of the main reasons as well is that numerous existing applications um, are there. So basically, we don't just see some simple applications that are there to demonstrate that it works but real applications have been used um, with OSV and then the last one um, it has nice community collaborative um, it's really nice to work with with them they're also m a member of the project um, just a quick show of the overall architecture um, the OSV kernel is on the left top uh, as you can see there are just few components of course they are not uh, not all of them um, but it, as you can see we have the driver for the network card we have the driver for, for block devices then there are some modules um, in particular the, the elf linking linker is one one of the important ones as you'll see in late, later on we have memory thread management and so on and on the right hand side we have an OSV image instance which which is composed of this kernel and some other modules that we'll see later on in talk Okay, so some of the advantages of, of a unikernel. Um, first of all, they are really lightweight. So the, the images that we get from unikernels range from hundreds of kilobytes to few megabytes. So there's no unnecessary overhead that typical operating system, typical cloud images provide in their base images. So this is, of course, efficient 
when we need to launch multiple applications, multiple images uh, on a distributed nodes, uh, as well as, of course, its energy more efficient. It boots extremely fast. In particular, for the language-specific unikernels, we are talking below half a second. And for, for some others, we were talking about one second, two seconds, or something like that. So it's really fast to boot. Most of them, or I will say, yeah, mo most of them require or support single address space. So we have a single user running everything uh, in a single address space. So we have a kernel and user applications. They are all in the same address space. There are no switches between the kernel and, and user mods, modes. So we also don't, don't need any, any permission checks because everything that runs within the OSV or, or the unikernel image is owned by that single user. Um, last, oh, sorry, not last. So the next is uh, there's no or at least little uh, legacy code that would um, stop or prevent from um, enhancing the kernel itself. Um, and last, uh, they are somewhat more secure. Uh, in a way, they are secure because they are running in a virtual machine and also because they are so small and they, co they, they contain only the, th the things that they need, um, the, the attack surface is rather small for them. Of course, um, there are plenty of dis disadvantages, even though we are, we are listing less than the advantages. Um, I, will, I will discuss each of these disadvantage disadvantages uh, next. Um, so, in a way, we said that single address space is, is an advantage because we don't need any permission checks, any, any additional constraints, limitations, and so on. But there is also a problem with that. Um, then there are missing functionalities in kernel and core libraries. Not, not, not everything is provided there. Um, it's rather complex, um, or it used to be rather complex to build applications for unikernels. Uh, these this things uh, improve, and there are some performance concerns. So now we go to the unikernels in the real world, so what it means to use the unikernel um, for your applications. So the first one, as we said before, single address space, uh, which means, as I said before, kernel libraries, user application, they are all sharing the same, the same address uh, space. Essentially, this means that um, we are not able to fork in a unikernel. So we have a single process running, uh, but we can run multiple threads. Whenever, whenever a fork will occur, the kernel will most probably die. So um, this talk is about HPC as well. Um, and m most of you know MPI, of course, and you know that MPI uses processes. So whatever you do with MPI, it uses processes. So this, this was the first hurdle, hurdle that we have to overcome when we were trying to use real applications with, the, with, the, with OSV. And for this to work, we actually had to change something in the kernel itself. So it's not, it's not easy to, or it's not always possible to replace a process with, with, with a thread. So we, sometimes it is, but most of the time this is not feasible. For example, if we, if we just look at, at the fact that the MPI will always pass different parameters to the process through environment var variables. And this is something that we cannot do with threads because they are sharing the same environment. And this is the first thing that we had to change in OSV so that we are able to pass different environments to each of the threads running in the same unikernel. The second thing that we had to do is to change the, the MPI. In this case, we took OpenMPI uh, implementation, um, which is actually using um, the SSH. So whenever you, you, you request a work on um, using MPI, it will connect to each of the target nodes and it will uh, through SSH and it will request workload to be launched. And what we did with that is that we changed the component required to, to uh, supporting this process to launch threads in different OSV instances instead. 
And we have now a working, working version of this. Basically, we are able to spawn as many, as many MPI uh, instances as possible, um, OSV instances, and launch MPI applications there. Um, nope. This is not what I... Sh what was that? Sorry about that. Okay. So this moves us to the second limitation of missing functionalities. Frequently, you will, you will find in, in, in a Unicron <coughs> that there are some missing system calls, there are some missing library, uh, functions in a, in a standard, library, standard libraries. They are just not there. Um, the good part of this is that these are rarely used in, in the context of, of a unikernel. So basically, these, these calls, these functions, are typically used in multi-process environments that make no sense in, in the unikernel. Um, and frequently, when we were dealing with these kind of problems, um, stubbing those functions, so basically just adding them to the, to the library, not doing anything there, solved the problem. Of course, not always. And this, this is one when the community comes in because the community of, of the OSV kernel um, will resolve most of the issues rather, rather quickly. Okay, the next thing um, are the applications. Uh, so if we are to use a unicorn, we will not be able to use unmodified binaries. In, in any way, we will have to do something with the application, with the source code of the application in order to use it um, I'm not talking about native applications, of course, so written in C, C++ programming languages. If we are to use Java or Node.js or whatever, you will be able to, to, to just deploy that onto the framework, of course. But if you have a C, C++ Fortran application, you will have to recompile, at least recompile the application. Uh, so this is the first one, uh, the typical changes, and the other one, um, Sometimes you will need to actually change the source code of your application um, to make it work. And of course the process is there, um, compile, compose, run, debug, and so on. So basically you, you, you really have to, to add this layer um, to your uh, workflow um, so that you're not just compiling um, the application to run on your hosts, but you also have to, to have another, uh, another step, uh, the compose step, and then run step with a unikernel to make, to make sure that it really works uh, in there. Okay, and then comes what we've been doing uh, in the project to support, to support this last step. So basically compose and run applications um, in a unikernel. Uh, so we've, we've decided that we would like to have uh, support for application packages that are basically composable building blocks. So we have, we, we, we take the kernel itself. So that's one module that we would like to include in our image. Then we would like to have the command line interface for the kernel, basically allowing us to, to run uh, some simple shell commands in the unikernel. Then I would like to have the open form application, which is comprised of different modules and, and also requires the open MPI application. I'll try to show you in the demo after this uh, part. So the package <coughs> itself should be sh self-sufficient. It, it should contain everything it needs to be run, to, to run, uh, and it can of course do this by itself or by including some dependencies, um, so basically providing what it needs to, to run in there. And the structure of a package is rather simple. On the left-hand side we have um, the, the only mandatory file here is actually the one called manifest. Um, so it's basically a package manifest file that will define some basic information about the package. Everything else is optional. And the right-hand side of this, of this image is basically a verbatim copy of, of a tree structure that you have in, in a package directory. So whatever you need to run the application there, you just put in a folder, uh, you, can use, so you can use arbitrary di directory structure. Uh, in this case, we've used user leap and user bin to indicate that these are binaries and these are some libraries. Okay, 
when we have a package, we, we need tools. And there are two tools in particular that we are, we are working in the project. First is called the Capstan tool, uh, which is a previously developed uh, tool that we extended to, to, get, to, to give this notion of an application package. What it, what it supports, um, it will allow you to manage your packages, your applications, um, so it will facilitate the initialization of a package, collection of the, the, the data, the files that are stored in each package, composition of virtual machine images, so we have a tool that will automatically build a runnable virtual machine image, uh, and also a tool to facilitate execution of these images, either in local environment or in, in uh, OpenStack um, in this case. There are also some run configurations which um, simplify the execution by providing standard ways to run your applications so that you don't have to type long commands. There because Unikernel doesn't have a shell in, 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 in the way that we know it um, in typical Linux. So it has some rather simple shell command or shell, shell um, command line interface that allows you to, to in, do something with, with a unikernel, but it doesn't have a complete, complete shell. The, the Capstan tool also has support for, um, so basically for pushing virtual machine images that we've just built uh, onto OpenStack and also to run, to run these images there. We also provide some uh, package hub which is a set of packages that we are working on uh, in, 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 the, in this project. And then there is another tool called Unique, a uh, rather new tool. Um, it's being developed by um, some guys, um, a group from EMSC. Um, it's really a nice tool, even though it's, I think it was first released in May this year, um, but it already supports plenty of the unicorns that I've mentioned before, and also plenty of providers, so basically the backend infrastructure providers that can be used to deploy these applications. Uh, and what, we've did, what, what we did for, for, for this, or what we added to Unique, um, is uh, the integration of the Capstan tool that I mentioned before, so that we have the notion of, a, of an application package in Unique as well, um, and we, we have added um, more advanced uh, image, and, uh, image and instance management uh, in Unique, uh, for OpenStack, um, for, the for the networking itself, and uh, the next step is to support the volumes um, as well. Okay, um, so I think this is the last slide before the, uh, the demo. Um, the nice thing about what we've been doing is that it mostly works out of the box with OpenStack. So these are the services that we are, we, we are currently using um, to, to, um, to add images, to add those um, images that are composed from application packages into Glans, um, to use Nova to, to launch these uh, instances there. Of course, there's some networking, but it's not really related to the, to the kernel itself. Um, it supports orchestration. And we also added some extensions for the, for, not for the OSV or for the unicorn, but for the application itself. Um, so one of the use cases uh, that we, we are using there. Okay. So I think that we have 10 minutes. Let's see if we can get this demo running. Okay. So it's working. Can, you, can everybody see there? Is it okay? Okay. So let me see this. Um, so this is this is what we call a package directory. As you can see, we have the meta file, um, which I can display what it contains. So we have some some information about the package, the name, the title, who is the vendor, and also the required packages. Um, the, re the, the required packages that we need in order to launch such an application. And in order to launch or to, to, to build, con to compose the application from this package, we can use just the cap uh, capstone tool. Cap capstone stack. Let's see stack. Like this. So what this will do is it will collect all the information from the current directory, also include everything that it's found 
in the package in the required packages and build a runnable machine image. And it already did us that, so we can just run the, the application now with its name. I will add the command there and stack demo demo one. I think it's the one. Let's see if that will work. Stack demo, what was it called? Stack demo. Demos, demos thank you. Demos, demo one. Okay. Okay, like this. So we have now a simple shell, shell in this OSV instance, and that's running on a virtual machine image on this, on this uh, machine. So as you, uh, as you saw before, this one also has a simple form application there um, used, and those of you that perhaps know OpenFOAM uh, will also notice that there is a case, so basically the input data file um, used um, or yeah, used by, by OpenFOAM whenever you would like to launch uh, the simulation. So in order to show this, let me try to do demos, um, demo one. And in a few seconds, it should start running the simulation. And it's using KVM here, as you can see. So basically, we have a new virtual machine image that's running the simulation on this, on this computer. Like this. OK, I think we're running out of time, so I will skip the other demos. So uh, yeah, we can discuss more demos later on. OK, I will go quickly. So the use cases or the case studies in the project, we have four of them. Um, I'll present three because the, the fourth has not been uh, started yet. Um, and the first one is the aerodynamic simulations that are used by, by a company from Slovenia. Um, they're using OpenFOAM. Um, again, if you know OpenFOAM, you know that that's a large um, source code um, repository containing a lot of different applications, different libraries used there. Um, but the good part was no changes to the code itself were required to support a unikernel. There were some changes necessary in the build system, mostly the one that, um, that um, needs, so OSV needs to have shared libraries um, in order to launch the applications in, in a unikernel. Um, and there were also some build dependencies missing in OpenFOAM itself. So this is what we had to change so that we were able to automate the process. There were a few missing functions in OSV and, and standard library that were added, rather simple calls, not critical for the, for, for the simulation, but of course they were necessary in order to launch there. Um, the good part is that, as you've saw before, um, we can run unmodified commands. So we don't need to change anything in order to launch applications in, in a unikernel. Um, and we also have multiple pre-built application packages for, for the OpenFOAM. So OpenFOAM is comprised of multiple applications, multiple, multiple sol solvers, and all of this just works um, using these packages. The other simulation is also an HPC application. Um, it's the bones tissue simulation. Uh, it's proprietary uh, simulation code, so source code. Um, there were some modifications in the, co in the code, but again, irrelevant for the simulation itself. So there were some missing functions in OSV, but in this case, we, we simply removed those functions from the source code itself. Um, recompilation was, was necessary, and again, we can run unmodified commands. The third use case, or the case study, is the big data. Um, there are three tools mentioned in this slide, Hadoop HDFS, Apache Storm, and Spark. Um, and f we have the HDFS implemented already. Um, there were just two forks um, in, the co in the Java code, which are, again, completely unnecessary for, for HDFS to run, to run there. 
And again, we can run unmodified commands there. Um, for the Storm and Spark, it's, let's say, slightly more trickier, um, but we have plans to, to, to implement this support so that we'll be able to launch Storm applications and Storm workers and Spark workers um, inside unikernels. Okay, the evaluation here um, is rather simple. Um, it's preliminary. Um, we have plans to add um, more complex evaluations by the end of this year. Um, but just to give you some idea of what we can achieve at this point with the Unicorn. So basically the project is ongoing um, and we are investing um, a lot of effort to, to make this work in, in this kind of environment. So to give you an idea of, of an image size, um, perhaps that's not fair comparison, but it's nice because it, it proves that we are smaller. Um, so we, we have uh, Ubuntu-based image. It was cloud, Im uh, cloud image. We added OpenFOAM there and made a snapshot. And we got an image, let's say image snapshot, that consumed two gigabytes um, of disk space. Um, on the other side, we have OSV, uh, where the entire image containing the kernel and OpenFOAM sources, the open MPI library, without the, the, the input case, of course, took only 65 megabytes. Of course, this is much more um, easier to, to distribute over the network. Um, the provisioning times, um, we have two, uh, two for Linux. Um, so for on, on, on first boot, uh, you can see that the spawn time is rather long. Uh, it took more than two minutes to launch the application on, 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 uh, on the next core instantiations, provisionings. The, this was much, much faster. But again, OSV uh, seems to outperform due to its uh, small footprint and small in initialization step. So basically, the booting is trivial. Uh, the runtime, um, again, rather small use case, uh, showing, showing two inter interesting parts. The first one is that um, we are getting 1% to 2% um, slower execution in OSV. We're still investigating whether time is lost for that. Um, and the other one is um, on the right-hand side. Um, so this is, um, this is one, one VM running on a single node, but we, with two NUMA, NUMA nodes. And as you can see, Linux quite, quite well outperforms OSV. Um, and it's, this, the problem here is that OSV is not NUMA aware at the moment. The, 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 middle, the middle case here uh, shows two VMs, each running on, 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 on its own uh, NUMA domain. Um, and of course, the, communi com the communication there is between, between, between the VMs is using um, TCP IP communication. And the reason why the last, the last part, the last uh, graph is, um, oh, in, in the last case, the OSV is even slower, slower than in the second case, where we are actually using TCP IP to communicate is because in the last case, the OSV um, or the MPI itself doesn't know that, they, that, that there are um, different types of um, processes. So in the second case, the MPI knows what it costs to communicate between the first four course workers and between the other four and, and between them. But in the, the, in the last case, this information is missing, basically the MPI think that they, they are all equivalent. So it distributes the workload um, in, a, in a worst or in a worse um, scenario, making it slower. Okay, quickly go over the future for duplication packaging, for duplication management. Um, this is something that we would like to get to so that what, whatever you saw today, um, we would like to, to have it integrated with with OpenStack applications. So we would like to have applications, not as packages and not as capstan co package compose tools. We would like to have this as something that a user can grab from, a, from, from the application catalog, um, compose automatically and deploy on the underlying infrastructure. So this is one thing. And uh, from the perspective of the entire project, um, there are, let's say, two high level goals. One is for the compatibility, so basically improving what can be run on, on the OSV unikernel, and, and, and then we have the performance uh, where we are working on, on this 
Um, so one is the dynamic IO workload manager that will dy dynamically adapt uh, or fix the IO cores necessary to execute your applications. Then there is a power virtual RDMA driver that will be built into OSV and Linux as well. Um, security and hypervisor, um, full HPC cloud and integration. Oop. Okay, I think that's, that concludes. Yeah. That's it.